So hello, I'm Chen Lin. I'm a CS PhD student from Stanford University. I'm very happy to be here today to share some of our work on AI for sustainable development. In the last few years, we've seen spectacular progress in many subfields of AI. In computer vision, we've seen massive performance improvements on a number of key tasks like image recognition. And we now have models that achieve performance similar to humans on comprehensive and difficult benchmarks. Similarly, in speech recognition, models based on deep neural networks achieve accuracies comparable to humans on key benchmarks. And these technologies are good enough that they're being deploying on hundreds of millions of smartphones and many other devices. As another example, advances in reinforcement learning have enabled computer agents to beat the best human players in a variety of games, including complex and highly strategic games like Go. The entire field of AI is booming. There is a lot of excitement and progress in pretty much every subfield of AI, from theory improving to planning and multi-agent systems. Decreasing hardware costs and general computing platforms are lowering the entry barrier of AI and facilitates new cross-domain ideas. It is very clear that these technological advances will have major impact on our society and on pretty much every sector of the economy. It's almost impossible to predict exactly what these changes will be and especially how long they will take, but we can get a glimpse of what's coming if we think about how existing technologies from computer vision, reinforcement learning, planning could be used in autonomous driving and how that would revolutionize transportation. How recent advances in robotics and automation could dramatically change home environments and how machine learning could revolutionize healthcare through personalized medicine and many more. It seems that existing technologies without even considering new ones that are being developed could have such a profound impact to the economy in, and inside workplaces. Now, given this immense transformative potential, an important question is, how do we make sure that these technologies are used to promote the well-being of humanity throughout the world and they don't become a catalyst to further increase inequality and they really benefit society at large? The major challenge we have on our hands right now is how to establish interactions of computers and humans to solve our society's most pressing problems. Because our society is facing some pretty formidable challenges to sustainable development. Over 80% of the people live in developing countries and 1 billion people live in poverty. Hundreds of millions don't have enough food to eat. Now what you see here are the 17 sustainable development goals identified by the United Nations as the key international priorities and include goals like ending poverty, fighting hunger, taking actions against climate change and reducing inequalities. Clearly, these are extremely important problems and could be the most pressing problems of our times. And in this, and in this talk, I will draw examples from our research and show that AI can provide actual insights into solutions of these problems. One of the reasons why this is a hard problem can be well summarized by this quote from Kofi Annan. We actually understand very little about what is going on, especially in the poorest part of the world. And these data gaps really undermine our ability to target resources, develop policies, and track accountability. Without good data, we're flying blind. If you can't see it, you can't solve it. Just to be more concrete, let's look at the goal number one that you see on the list, which is ending extreme poverty by 2030. In order to solve this problem, it is good to have a way to measure progress towards this goal using economic related data. The typical way people collect data on economic related outcomes is through nationally representative surveys. Surveys are in general expensive to do. You need to have, you, you need to have some people on the ground knocking on doors and collecting data. It is a very manual process. And as a result, they are not done very frequently 
Here are the figures coming from a study done by a recent science paper. It is evaluating how much economic related data is available throughout the world in different countries. Here, each country is color coded by the frequency between two consecutive surveys averaged across the world. You can see that there are many countries that are red or orange, meaning that there could be decades between two consecutive surveys in certain countries. There are countries that are black, meaning that there is no survey data available at all for these countries. As you can imagine, with this kind of data, it's very hard to track progress towards ending poverty to figure out whether the policies that governments are implementing are working or not. It's very hard to track accountability. It's very hard to do social science research if you're trying to understand economic development. And this is not just the economic surveys. If you look at population censuses or agricultural censuses, again, the key inputs in a lot of these problems, the big problems that we're trying to solve, the data available today is very scarce as censuses are done very infrequently and surveys are also done infrequently. Even if they are done, the surveys are often sampling the population in a very sparse way although in a very representative way, but it is still a very sparse way. In summary, we have these big problems, but we only have very limited data. One of the things we have been thinking about is whether there are better and more scalable ways to collect data in a global scale. We have been working on combining globally available and cheap data from satellites, phones, and crowdsourcing data with the recent advances we see in AI and machine learning to provide insights into sustainability problems. In the last decade, there has been an enormous progress in the quality and quantity of the data that has become available. The image you see on this slide is an example of a satellite image you could get from space about 10 years ago. Here you can see that the image is really pixelated with each pixel representing an area of 30 meters by 30 meters. Although this image is really useful, you cannot see clearly what is going on on the ground. These days, it's very easy to get higher resolution images. Here is an example you can get today from the same location. The pixel size is three meter by three meter. You can see things on the ground more clearly. And these images are available today pretty much everywhere in the world. There are also, they are also updated very frequently. And you can get an image of this resolution for almost everywhere in the world updated every day. Recall, we, recall what we discussed in the previous slides. Survey data are, are often scarce and expensive to collect. The promise here is that there is perhaps a way to fill in this data gap of surveys by incorporating these new sources of data that are cheap, plentiful, and available everywhere with machine learning to develop more scalable ways to understand what is going on on the ground. My collaborators recently did analysis where they take a random household and check how frequently will this household show up in one of these nationally representative surveys that people do. Given the frequency of surveys done today, a typical household in Africa will show up in one of these surveys about once every thousand years because the surveys are done very infrequently. And whenever there is a survey, only very few households in the country are sampled in the survey. Even in the US, a typical household would show up once every 10 years, roughly. On the other hand, the frequency for a typical household to show up in one of these satellite images is around once every week or every month. There is several orders of magnitude difference here. If we can figure out ways to extract useful information from these images in an automated way, there could really be transformative, um, that could really be transformative in the way we measure economic development and socioeconomic outcomes of, <clears throat> of various kinds on the ground. As, as mentioned previously, ending poverty is the number one goal on the 2030 development agenda. Poverty data is scarce and expensive to obtain because they're mainly survey data. For example, in the decade of 2000 and 2010, 
there is no survey data available in many African countries. On the other hand, satellite images are globally available, updated frequently, and getting increasingly more and more accurate. The idea here is to use deep learning advances to predict economic indicators. Given an input satellite image, we can feed it into a neural network and train the network to output a predicted economic indicator. The hope here is that the neural network can capture features related to economic development, like roads and waterways in the image. Once the model is trained, we can pick some images and visualize the maps in the intermediate layers of the learned model. The model after training can learn semantically meaningful features like roads and waterways. These features can be useful for predicting economic indicators. Here are model predictions on daily, daily per capita expenditure in Uganda and Tanzania. The estimates produced by machine learning algorithms turns out to be quite accurate. Our collaborators have done extensive studies and show that using satellite images in AI, we can get good prediction almost as accurate as ground-based surveys. It is shown that our prediction can explain about 70% of the vibrations on the ground just by using satellite images. We have reasons to believe that the results are pretty good because even the ground truth number we have can be affected by measurement errors because there are survey data, there could be measurement error there. We also have reasons to believe that the predictions made by the models could be even better than the evaluation results we have because we don't have perfect ground truth to compare with because there, there are error in the survey data. After we have trained the model, we can apply the model to predict economic indicator for all continents using frequently updated satellite images. By changing the time of the input satellite images, you can see how the asset wealth is changing over time. We can zoom in all the way to districts to see which region is doing better, which one is not, because we can get satellite images from almost everywhere in the world. We can just feed them into the machine learning models and they can produce these accurate estimations. Predicting economic indicator is an important problem because it helps with ending poverty. If we can understand the distribution of poverty, the regional governments can design policies to assist those who are in need. The predicted poverty map can be used to improve responses from regional governments and international aid organizations. Mapping poverty with satellite images has got lots of attention from the media, from the New York Times to the Washington Post. And in 2016, this idea was selected by Scientific American as the 10 ideas that will change the world. Besides satellite images, another similar strategy we can use is to leverage crowdsourced data sets, in particular Wikipedia. It turns out that a lot of Wikipedia articles are geolocated. There is an info box on the right of the article, which contains the coordinates of the entity that is being described in the article. And at the same time, each article also comes with a category box located at the bottom of each article. The idea is that we can go to the geolocation provided um, by the info box, collect the satellite image and pair it with the label extracted from the category box in the Wikipedia article. So given the geolocated Wikipedia article, we extract the geolocation and category information and then collect the satellite image at that geolocation. Here is an example of the image we can collect using the geolocation from the info box. We pair it with the category, which gives us an image and label pair. In many sustainability applications, we're interested in understanding the content of satellite images because the content of satellite images can provide actual insights into economic developments, education, and health-related outcomes. For instance, a satellite image of a school often implies that the nearby region could have a high education level. And similarly, an image of a hospital could imply that the neighborhood is likely to have good facilities. 
Our next question is, how are Wikipedia articles distributed and how many articles do we have? Here is a distribution of geolocated English Wikipedia articles. There are, there are around 1 million geolocated English Wikipedia articles globally. If we take a closer look at the figure, we can see continents from the plot. One thing to note here is that we did not overlay co the coordinates of Wikipedia articles on the shape of continents. The shape of continent arises automatically because people tend to write articles about things close to them. So the shape of the continents emer emerges automatically by just plotting the locations of the geolocated Wikipedia articles. Here are some more examples of the image and label pair we collect based on Wikipedia articles. As we can see, the labels and image content are matched. This shows that Wikipedia can provide us with a paired image and label data set. This is very exciting because labeling millions of images manually by human experts is often expensive and time consuming. However, by leveraging open sourced Wikipedia data sets, we can automatically pair a satellite image with this corresponding class label, which is more efficient. Given the Wikipedia data set, which contains 1 million labeled satellite image, we can train a model on this new data set. Basically, given an input image and its label collected from a geolocated Wikipedia article, we feed the image into the model and teach the model to predict the corresponding class label, which in this case is port. When the input image is a stadium, we train the model to predict stadium. Once the model is trained, given an input image without label, we feed the image into the model and ask the model to predict what class the, this image belongs to. The model will then output port as a predicted label for the image. We show that models trained on Wikipedia datasets can achieve good image classification performance. This is very encouraging because we could apply the model trained on the Wikipedia dataset to interpret the content of new satellite images, potentially applying to various new applications in sustainability. Wikipedia articles can also be combined with satellite images to predict economic development. Given a location which we are interested in predicting the economic indicator, we can go to that location and collect the satellite image and nearby Wikipedia articles. To process the image information, we introduce a neural network to extract the feature of the image. After feeding the image input into the image model, we get a visual embedding, which is a vector. And similarly, for the Wikipedia article, in order to extract information from the article, we introduce another text model. We feed the Wikipedia article into the text model, and the model would output a text embedding, which is also a vector. We can then combine the text embedding with the visual embedding to predict the economic indicator. More specifically, given the concatenated Wikipedia text embedding and visual embedding, we'll introduce another neural network to extract the feature of the concatenated embeddings. We feed the concatenation into the neural network and directly train the model to predict an economic indicator. Here are some results from the Wikipedia model. On the left, we show the ground truth asset wealth indices for Tanzania. And on the right, we show the predicted asset wealth using Wikipedia and remote sensing. If we compare the right figure with the left one, as we can see, the prediction is pretty accurate because the right figure looks very similar to the right one. Our findings suge suggest this pipeline of using geolocated Wikipedia article has applications not just in poverty analysis, but also more general socioeconomic prediction, such as education and health-related outcomes. We hope this approach will accelerate progress towards the UN SDGs by improving the way we estimate lacking socioeconomic indicators, particularly in developing countries, with the aim of improving responses from regional governments and international aid organizations. Moving on, we have also been looking at different kinds of outcomes we can measure from space. 
in particular the ones that are related to food security. We have been looking at agricultural outcomes and trying to build systems that can understand agricultural productivity across wide regions using advances in satellites and machine learning algorithms or computer vision. Food security is still a problem. As you can see from this graph, the situation is getting better and better, but then it's getting slightly worse across the world. We've been looking at to what extent we can use remote sensing data to understand agricultural productivity, which is a key input in many food security measures. There are a number of other things that can be explored. For instance, we can estimate population density. There is also a recently published paper on mapping brick kilns using remote sensing images. Brick manufacturing is a major source of pollution in many countries, but is dominated by small scale informal producers who are difficult to monitor and regulate. And in this paper, researchers are able to build a comprehensive map of where all the brick kilns are and provide analysis on whether they are in compliance with environmental laws, whether they are too close to schools and how the numbers are changing over time. Besides satellite images, there are also other kinds of widely available data sets that contain information about what's going on on the ground. For instance, street level images like Google Street View, except that Google Street View is only available in selected countries, there is an alternative called Mapillary, which is actually crowdsourced, so it's available all over the world. As you can see on the slide, these images contain lots of information on the ground about, about infrastructure, about economic development, about people. We're very excited about this idea of potentially combining images taken from space with images taken from the ground. because there are things you cannot see from space because the resolution is limited in satellite images, but perhaps you could complement it with images taken from the ground, which might provide an even more accurate estimation about economic development and the situation on the ground. Here are some resources for papers discussed in this talk. At Stanford, we also have a course called CS325B, which focuses on combining AI with large-scale globally available data sets to provide insights into sustainability issues. Feel free to scan the QR code and check it out. And finally, and most importantly, I would like to thank my advisor, Professor Stefano Ehrman, for the great support and great guidance on research. And I also want to thank Professor Marshall Burke and Professor David Lobel for their guidance on the research. Thank you for coming to the talk and feel free to let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Chen Lin. Uh, probably in the interest of time, I think we'll, we'll have to skip the Q&A, but thank you so much. That was so interesting and to hear what you can do with Wikipedia information, who knew that you could um, tie that to poverty levels. So thank you again very thank much you. for that talk. Thank you.